our last program we had discussed foreign trade and saw how the emergence of the foreign companies changed the whole foreign trade scenario in India. Before the coming of the Portuguese, the Indian merchants would carry their merchandise to the Persian Gulf. From there, another group would take it to Cairo and Alexandria. The merchants from Europe would come to Cairo and Alexandria and trade there. The foreign companies proved that this was not necessary and direct trading was possible. In this program, we shall see how this trade progressed. Now the structure of the European trade with India had changed considerably. First we have seen the Portuguese were taking spices, mainly paper from Malabar. Then after the Portuguese, the English and the Dutch started cheap cloth. Then later, from 1690s, they began to take fine cloth like muslin, other commodities like raw silk, raw cotton, opium, sulphur, etc. Even indigo to some extent and oil also to some extent. So the structure of the European trade was not consistent or uniform, nor it was permanent. But what they followed, their method that was started by the Portuguese had remained. We now come to the activities of the Indian merchants. Compared to the European supremacy later on, it has been ascertained by earlier historians that the Indian merchants did not have much of trade. It is true that the Europeans had made tremendous progress so far as their trade was concerned. After all, the commodity of India was selling at 300% more in prices in Europe. Therefore, the profit was tremendous. There was also the private trade of the merchants, of the companies, as well as of other merchants. But nowadays, it is more or less ascertained that the trade of the Indian merchants was quite substantial. As a matter of fact, the American historian Holden Farber had shown that in the mid-18th century, the, in the western coast, the total investment of the Europeans was much less than those of the Indian merchants. But by that time, the western coast was practically deserted by the Europeans to a certain extent to which we would come later. The, in, the structure of the organization of the Indian merchants was different from those of the Europeans. Indian merchants' business was princi principally based on family and to some extent it is community oriented. That is the Hindu merchants who tend to go to the Hindu ship owners, Muslim merchants who tend to go to the Muslim ship owners. There was no question of joint stock. There was no evidence of Hindu Muslim uh, working together for trade. But there was no communal clash either. In the Indian Ocean trade, so far as the Indian merchants are concerned, there was certainly competition, very, very stiff competition, but there was also the compromise. So therefore, the final con kind of conflict was not there at all, at least till the middle of the 18th century. The Indian merchants had two directions to cover. One is South 
East Asia and the other Western Asia or the Middle East. Out of this, the Middle East was the most important to them because in Southeast Asia, there was no cash nexus and therefore there were merely the exchange of commodities. But in the Western Asia, the Indians carried cloth of all varieties. As a matter of fact, they defeated the Portuguese in, the, in this kind of battle. And their principal port was Mukha, which was called the treasury of the Indian Mughals. They had taken or carried the commodities, particularly of cloth and also spices to Mukha, and in return they brought gold, silver, and copper, either in bullion or in foreign currency. But they also went beyond that. It has been shown recently that the Indian merchants or their agents had settled along the coasts of Persia during this time. They had even reached the shores of Russia, particularly in the Caspian Sea. Even it has been found that the temples had been established in Persia by the Hindus. So once again, we do not see any communal problem involved in this. Both the Hindu and the Muslim merchants used to trade with Persia, Persia and Russia. Now, in the Indian merchants' case, they had a problem with the Portuguese because the Portuguese had a long warfare with the Muslims. And in the 16th century, particularly in the early days, they did not want the Muslims to come to Persia or to other places. This gave the opportunity to Hindu and Jain merchants of Gujarat to take their places. But gradually that kind of attitude of the Portuguese was changed and Malacca was opened to the Gujarati Muslims as well. In case of the Indian merchants, as I have mentioned, it is mainly the question of the family. The head of the family is the person who decides. The, it has its own problem. The problem is that in the case of the death of the head of the family, the business runs into difficulties. Now, the Indian merchants, it has been stated by an Indonesian scholar, Van Lior, were mainly peddlers. That is the trade in small quantities on trivial goods. This theory has been totally rejected now. It has been found, and as I would discuss it a little bit briefly later, there were plenty of very rich Indian merchants. Particularly in the western coast, we have a galaxy of talents. For example, we have Ahmed Chelabi, who was originally Turkish, but settled in Surat. Then we have Abdul Ghafur, who was considered to be the richest merchant of the world in, in his times. Then we have the Bohra brothers, who had more than 20 ships. And later on in the 18th century, we, we have Muhammad Ali, whose house at Surat was rented by the French, and the French had trouble with him for various reasons. Now, there are certain others also. There are shipbuildings in Surat, in Cambe, as well, according to Tavernier, the 17th century French traveler, at Dhaka also. But we find very few Indian merchants having ships excepting those few, very rich, the rest of the Indian merchants did not have ships of their own. The reason was perhaps the profit in the Indian Ocean trade was very small. 
and the capital that has to be invested in building the ship would take at least three years to come. So the, generally the Indian merchants did not prefer to have their ships, at least the smaller ones, and they used to take the ships of others. But this had its own problems which I would discuss later. The merchant community can be divided into three groups. The first is the very rich merchants who owned fleets of ships and they travelled along with their wares and officers to different places of trade. The second is the ones who sent their agents. These were very wealthy traders, including the Mughal emperors as well. The third is the small trader, who travelled from port to port and sold their wares, often undercutting the big traders. Mughal emperors and Mughal royalty, they had their ships and they used to go to West Asia as well as to Southeast Asia. But they always employed agents. Even the Subhadas of Bengal from 1660 onwards till the end of the 17th century or early 18th century, they used to have their ships and their agents to trade. So the second type was a very big one, a very rich one also, and very influential also. There were others who were connected with the Indian foreign trade, the Dalals, the money changers, the money lenders, the captains, and even the sailors were very active in this business. Let us begin with the Dalals. Once the goods come out of the custom house, then it is their job to find the contact man, find the right kind of merchants for the distribution of the goods. They are called Dalal in a pejorative sense, but actually they were most essential in a very big market. Without them, the system would collapse. There is the other one the second type of person, the Mahajan or the Saraf. They were the bankers. In reality, the changer of foreign currency, who often give loans also as well to the merchants. And they are in almost every port changing the foreign currency into Mughal rupees. Now, normally, the Mughal mint was a free one. Anyone can go, pay a small amount of money, about 10% of the bullion, and get the money converted into Mughal rupee, whatever the money, foreign money is or bullion is. But in practice, it is a difficult thing. It is a difficult thing because the ships would come almost within the space of two months, in August, September, because of the wind. And they would leave again in December. So what they would do, the ship owners and the ship merchants of the ship, is to try to get as early as possible the foreign currency converted into the Mughal rupee so that they could give advance to the weavers and to others. As a matter of fact, without advance, one could not hope to get any reasonably well-priced goods. And the advance takes about 10 months to fulfill. In order to overcome this difficulty, the English and the Dutch used to give advance for the next year. So they were not in a hurry. But the French, did not have that kind of capital. Therefore, they went to the Mughal Mint or at times they dealt with the private money changers who charged exorbitant rates of exchange in their favour. So the Indian merchants' activities were not merely limited to the running the ship. Actually, 
the captain of the ship, who is called Nakhoda, whose crew is mostly Muslim, very few Hindus are there, the captain is also something like a merchant. He had his own goods, and sometimes he takes charge of the goods of other Indian merchants, and they would, he would sell this at a commission. The crew who is mostly Muslim, because perhaps because of the injunction of the Hindus against sea, crossing the sea. Now, as I have said, Southeast Asia was another direction. Now, by the middle of the 17th century, Southeast Asia was becoming converted into cash nexus. That is, money was being accepted. And the Indian merchants were in the full swing. But first the Portuguese began to conquer the ports. Then the Dutch took over from the Portuguese. And by the end of the 17th century, the Dutch had conquered most of the ports of the Southeast Asia, devouring the practically the Indian merchants from trading there without paying a very high tax. This has been estimated as one of the causes of the decline of Surat, because it was the Surat merchants who used to make this trading venture. So therefore, till the mid of the 17th century or even the late 17th century, the Indian merchants were doing fairly well. From 1670, the problem started in the western coast. The pirates, particularly the European pirates, began to plunder the ships of the Indian merchants. And one could see that the European mar merchants and the European companies were withdrawing the investment from the western coast to the eastern coast. This has resulted in the rise of Hooghly and Patna, because Coromandel was, uh, particularly Masali Patna, was practically uh, vandalized by the Dutch. But the Southeast Asian ports continued under the Dutch, away from the control of the Indian merchants. The another reason was that the Indian merchants, they had ships with less security. Their cannons were not properly manned, not properly arranged, and the European shipping was better. From the 18th century, particularly with the emergence of the European pirates, Indian merchants prefer the ships of Europe. What did the Indian export consist of? We know that spices, particularly pepper, was a very popular item for export. A large quantity of cloth in all forms, both cotton, silk and muslin, was also exported. What came out in the 18th century most was the opium and sulphur, particularly from Patna, due to the warlike activities in Europe and the establishment of the new Karkhanas of ammunition. Apart from that, indigo was at one time very important. Sometimes its demand rises and sometimes it falls. Biana near Agra was very good, of best quality, but it was gradually abandoned by 1670 by the Dutch, who were the principal takers and they shifted to Sarkej in Digonia Ahmedabad. Sugar in Bengal was important. It continued to be important till the 70s of the 17th century. But after that, 
the sugar from West Indies created problem for it. So the commodities of India did not remain the same, it continued to change. In case of the imports into India, initially and till late, the principal items of gold, silver, copper and other foreign currencies from Europe which came via Middle East. Middle Eastern ports, as I have said, Mokha was called the treasury of the Indian Mokhals. But the Indians had very good trade at, with, the Af with the Africans controlled by the Arabs. The Arabs cooperated with the Indians. In the beginning, it was slave, gold and ivory which came to India. Later on, slaves were not imported, gold and ivory, particularly from Malindi and from certain other ports, Kilwa, etc., these were imported into India. But the most important Middle Eastern import was the horse. And it has been estimated now that how many horses used to come a fantastic number every year from the Middle East of different types, Turkish, Syrian, Arabian, etc. Abu Fazal in his Aini Akbari had given the description of the horses, the differences between them, the prices ranging and so on and so forth. The Mughals continued to imp imp import horses from these areas and some elephants from Ceylon as well. Although the principal elephant source was Assam and to a certain extent Bengal. So therefore the imports were much less compared to the exports which was in favor of India. The, Engli the English East India Company, the Dutch and the French, they had a problem. The problem is that while coming into India, they must have enough goods as ballast to the ships. That is, a portion of the ship should be heavily loaded so that it could remain under water. But there was nothing that India could take except gold, silver, copper and horses. So what the English people did, they used to bring earth from England, make it as ballast and take this to India, some of which had been used in the construction of Calcutta. As a matter of fact, it is stated that Park Street was made on this. But whatever the reason is, the English, Dutch and the French, they were trying to import long cloth, coral, and in case of English, wool. Wool did not sell here. Long cloth was also not sold very much. Coral was sold to a certain extent. The French brought Bordeaux wine, the red wine of Bordeaux, but that did not sell very much in those days. Rather, they then shifted to bring, import pistols, revolver, watches, rose water from Persia, etc. And to some extent, Persian wine as well, called Siraji because this was from Shiraj. So, if we look at the total picture of the export trade of India, overseas trade of India, we would see that the export trade was heavily in favor of India, at least till the middle of the 18th century. Once the English had become paramount in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa, had become Dewan in 
1765 of these places, the whole structure changed. In summary, one can say that India exported mainly cloth, both silk and cotton, expensive and cheap. In addition to this, it exported opium, sulphur, indigo and sugar in big quantities. It imported slaves, gold and ivory from Africa. But slave import did not last very long. The balance of trade was always in favor of India during the Mughal period. This is proved by the fact that ships came empty from abroad and to keep the hull partially underwater, they had to fill it with nothing but mud. <laughs>